out and see if this actually works. Hey, it does. Awesome. Yay. I love it when a plan comes together. I hate it when a plan doesn't. <laughs> Unfortunately, that's kind of more my life, you know? <laughs> well, that was my life today, too. All the things seem to line up together and then sad. Yeah. 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 At least it went okay. <laughs> Actually, it really works. Yeah, everything works. Oh, and if nobody was paying attention, they would have not noticed the fact that I mentioned features that we don't use. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I, I did the talk on uh, flexible and fast software delivery with OBS. Whoa. Uh, yeah. yeah. Yeah, decades. Decades. That's not good. Whoa, your computer's on the fridge. Uh, I prefer to blame it. I blame it for until you told from her. Wow. That was not what I was intending to happen. I blame the laptop. Uh, perhaps mismatching resolution. Too many stickers. Yeah, that's. All right. Cool. Wow, more people showed up than I expected. I wasn't sure anyone would want to talk, uh, talk you know, come to a talk that just focuses on what we do with the community. So thank you for being here. I appreciate it. We do a lot, and we're terrible about telling people about it. So I'm going to get up here and tell people about it. <laughs> All right. I am showing that it is, uh, it is 4.30, so we'll get started. Um, hello, everybody. My name is Thomas Cameron. Uh, I'm a senior principal cloud engineer in the uh, engineering business unit at Red Hat. Um, <clears throat> My contact information is up here. I am Thomas at RedHat.com. I've been here for long enough that, yes, I have the Thomas at RedHat.com email address. And you can follow me on Twitter at Thomas D. Cameron. What I want to talk about today, like I said, is um, we, we don't... Red Hat does not like to, you know, thump our chest and talk about how awesome we are and what we do, and uh, and so I think we don't talk enough about and explain enough about what we do with the various open source communities that we work with. So I want to spend a little bit of time today doing just that. Um, I'll talk a little bit about where we came from, where Red Hat came from, uh, where we are today. I want to actually also interject something about what we do from a business perspective because a lot of people think of us as just another software company and I want to explain a little bit about why that's not the case seg into what our mission is because our mission actually calls out community our mission statement actually calls out community it is ingrained in our DNA I'll talk a little bit about some of the projects we work with um, I'll talk about some of the acquisitions and how that has affected communities uh, and then I'll talk about some legal issues that Red Hat has been involved in uh, on behalf of communities some of the community programs that we uh, help sponsor uh, the developer programs and why we do what we do so first off, where we came from, um, a lot of folks, it's really funny, I still read articles that talk about Red Hat as, you know, the scrappy newcomer to the IT industry. And, and I'm like, I, I'm not kidding. We got a, a new, what was it, we got a best, you know, young company or something like that, like just a few years ago. And I was like, what? we started in 93. Like, we're old. But um, yeah, we were started in 93 by a hacker by the name of Mark Ewing and a businessman by the name of Bob. Young. Uh, Bob sold, he had a catalog business. He sold computers and media with free software on it uh, out of his bookstore. And Mark built a Linux distribution called Red Hat Linux. Bob sold so many copies of it that he approached Mark and said, I want to buy your organization. I want to buy your company. And they adopted the name Red Hat Software and went forward as a going concern. Uh, and in 99, we did well enough that we were one of the most successful. I think at that point, we were the seventh largest IPO. Uh, to date. So um, went from nothing to a huge IPO in just a few years. Um, in 99, we really changed the way that we did business because previous to 99, we were just a distribution. We, we packaged up software from you know various projects upstream, created the distribution, sold it, and we're successful at it. But in 99, that really changed when we acquired Cygnus Software. Cygnus Software, it was a hardcore engineering company that did a lot of kernel stuff and did a lot of tool chain stuff uh, that, that allowed open source software to be ported to different hardware architectures. Um, that 
that changed the way that Red Hat worked. At that point, we went from just being a distribution to actually doing a lot of hardcore engineering and contributing a lot of code upstream. We had contributed before, but with the Cygnus acquisition, that really led to us being a powerhouse in the open source community because we were able to actually do a lot of really good engineering work and contribute code upstream. So from very, very early in our days, upstream was really important to us, and I'll explain why in a little while. In 2002, we changed from a consumer-based model where we were selling box sets at you know Best Buy and CompUSA and praying that people would buy our software uh, and, and augmenting our business or augmenting our revenues with like T-shirt and ball cap sales to an enterprise model with Red Hat Enterprise Linux, and that actually was a pretty controversial move. There were a lot of folks in the community who had gotten free distributions from us, Red Hat Linux, uh, and when we turned around and said, "Hey," we're not going to do free distributions anymore. We're going to sell subscriptions to software. There was a lot of bad, uh, a lot of animus from some, some parts of the community. Uh, and so from 2002 through today, there are still some people who are, you know, a little chapped at Red Hat because, because we don't give our, our uh, flagship distribution away for free. We, uh, we sell subscriptions to it. Um, this was a massive change. This was a huge change. Uh, and companies like Dell and HP and IBM and even Oracle threw in their support behind us. Uh, we were arguably the first to market an enterprise open source, and I, I think it's pretty fair to say that we have been the most successful open source company uh, to date. Uh, today, we're approaching $3 billion in revenues. We've got over 80 offices in something like 40 countries around the globe. Uh, and we have about 12,000 people uh, that, that work at Red Hat. So there are a ton of folks that are doing work around the, uh, the software and the technology that we sell subscriptions to and also committing code upstream. Now, as I said earlier, a lot of people think, oh, Red Hat's just another software company. But let's be real clear. We don't sell software licenses. The license under which you use the software that we, that we support and, and sell subscriptions to is an open source license. It's the GPL, one of the versions of GPL or LGPL or uh, Apache software license or MIT license or whatever. There are a ton of licenses that are uh, included in our technologies. But we don't sell software licenses. When you get a subscription to one of the Red Hat technologies that we sell subscriptions to, it's not just about the bits. The bits are certainly part of it because we deliver the bits through our content delivery network, but it's about our technical leadership. It's about accessing the bits from, the, from our network. It's about knowledge base access and all the solutions that we have there. A big one is it's about a 10-year life cycle for open source technologies. Now, if you work with open source technologies, you know that in a lot of cases, you know, a six-month-old package is completely out of date. But in an enterprise environment, you don't want to be upgrading your infrastructure every six months. So, you know, having that long life cycle is important. Uh, product documentation, how-tos, tips and tricks, things like that. A big one in enterprise space is security. We have a huge security team that's global that reacts to post-release security incidents and then also hardens our software to make sure, or at least to try to make sure that we don't have any security issues when it goes out of the gate. Um, it allows access, the subscription allows access to the labs on our uh, portal, so you can do things like pre-configure um, various services and pull down config files. Um, it, it's access to the solution engine and support. Uh, solution engine is when you type in a problem, it'll actually use AI to go and search through our knowledge base to see if uh, there's something that matches it. Um, support up to and including 24-hour uh, follow the sun. A big one, software compatibility. Um, you know, we test our software with our partners uh, like, you know, SAP and Oracle and IBM and, and things like that. So when you install that software, it's, it's a certified solution. Um, it's access to education and certification. You know, you, you've heard of folks who are Red Hat certified engineers, for instance. Legal protection, which I'll talk more about in a little while. This is important to a lot of our uh, enterprise customers. And that partner ecosystem, that partner partner ecosystem of ISVs and IH, I'm sorry, independent software vendors and independent hardware vendors and VARs and, and consulting groups and things like that. And then certification on common and popular hardware platforms from, you know, Dell and HP and Lenovo and so on. So it's not that we're selling bits. The bits are only a tiny part of what the subscription brings. So when you hear people talking about, oh, software, you know, Red Hat's just another software company, company it's really not just, it's not that. 
If you look at Red Hat's mission statement online, this is our published mission statement. It says, our mission is to be the catalyst in communities of customers, contributors, and partners creating better technology the open source way. This is in our DNA. You will hear me say that over and over and over again. We are totally dedicated to working in communities, whether it's communities of customers or upstream communities, and I'll, I'll give some examples of that. So, what projects does Red Hat work with? I think before I, I go any further, what is the first thing you think of when you think of Red Hat? Red Hat Linux, right? I mean, for the most part, people think of Red Hat as a Linux company, which is fantastic because that's certainly where we came from. That was where we started, was in the Linux space. But there's a whole lot of other stuff that goes on at Red Hat. Red Hat Enterprise Linux is one product out of all of these technologies that Red Hat sells subscriptions to. So there's Red Hat Virtualization, there's Red Hat OpenStack, Red Hat Storage, which is Gluster and Ceph, uh, Red Hat Satellite for Systems Management, Red Hat JBoss Middleware, which is like, I'm gonna show you some of the things that we do in middleware, and it's like multiple pages of technologies. Um, Red Hat Mobile Application Development and Management, a lot of people don't think of that with Red Hat. Uh, Red Hat OpenShift for uh, Container Management, Red Hat Core OS, Core OS is now a Red Hat product property. Um, Manage IQ for cloud management. Ansible is now a Red Hat property. We acquired them not too long ago. Um, and for every one of these products that we sell subscriptions to, there's an upstream project that we sponsor and maintain and contribute to. So, you know, RDO and Overt.org and the Fedora project, CentOS project. CentOS is also a Red Hat technology now. Um, you know, the upstream core OS, uh, OpenShift Origin, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Now, that's a whole lot of communities right there. But the argument could be made, well, you know, that's just upstream for your products, right? You know, that's not real community. I disagree because we do everything in those upstream communities. Nothing makes it into Red Hat Enterprise Linux, or almost nothing makes it into Red Hat Enterprise Linux. I won't say nothing because there's always going to be some weird corner case, but but generally nothing makes it into uh, upstream uh, into Red Hat Enterprise Linux that didn't come through the Fedora project. We put everything out in the community, freely distributable, downloadable, open source technologies. The same is true for Overt.org, the same is true for OpenShift Origin, the same is true for Manage IQ, Gluster.org, Ceph, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Those are all communities, but then there are, I don't know, about a million other projects out there that we are aware of and try to keep an eye on uh, that we work with, like the Apache and, and OpenStack and things like that. So there's a ton of work that we do around communities upstream, but it goes a lot deeper than just what you see on the screen. These are projects that we are involved in that are not productized. They may be part of a product, uh, but these are these are things that we are involved with. From a foundation perspective, we're with the cloud native. We're a part of the cloud native uh, computing foundation, the LibreOffice Foundation, Linux Foundation, OpenNFV, Python, blah 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 blah. I mean, you can see that these are all foundations, free software foundations that we are members of uh, to some level or another. So we do a ton of work around standards that have that are not you know necessarily product related. And let's be real clear: the truth of the matter is, by working with these upstream projects and making sure that there are standards which are repeatable across different communities and different technologies, the truth of the matter is, this makes it easier, not harder, to migrate off of our commercial offerings. We make sure that things are standardized across communities so that they work no matter what. Now, we don't want you to, obviously, <laughs> but, uh, but the reality is, by being members of these foundations and standardizing things, we make it a lot easier for you to do other stuff. From an operating system perspective, I know this is kind of an eye chart for those of you in the back, I apologize, but um, you know the CentOS project, Fedora, Cygnus, um, and Upstream GNU, and Linux projects, and all of these utilities, all of these technologies, which are, yes, certainly part of Red Hat Enterprise Linux in a lot of cases, but also part of Fedora, and a lot of these technologies have been adopted by you know, Canonical and by SUSE and by Slackware and, and so on, and that's part of the deal. 
that's part of the deal. We know that a strong, vibrant, upstream community, you know, a rising tide raises all ships. And so it's a good thing that the stuff that we're involved with, like upstream Linux and SE Linux and uh, System D and, and so on, uh, it's a good thing that there is a large and vibrant set of communities around these technologies. If you look at containerization, we're part of, you know, Cockpit and Cryo and Docker and Flannel and Kubernetes and Atomic and Rocket and so on. Uh, because, again, having a strong upstream community makes all technologies better, including ours. Certainly there is a, there is a component of we want to have uh, the best technology in the market. But we participate in those upstream communities by contributing code, by contributing governance, by contributing bodies, uh, and so on. So, And then from a desktop perspective, Again, there's a ton of work that we do around GNOME. There's a ton of work that we do around LibreOffice uh, and a whole bunch of other upstream uh, um, technologies for the desktop like Xorg and uh, things like that. Um, so a lot of work that we do in those upstream communities to make the desktop better and everybody wins. All the distributions use those technologies. From a middleware and identity management standpoint, um, I've got an interesting story about our identity management platform that I'll tell you in just a few minutes. But if you look at what we do upstream with the Apache web server, for instance, and what we do with uh, the various JBoss.org projects around application services and data virtualization and uh, memory in-memory caching of, of big applications and things like that, there are a ton of projects and communities in upstream that we contribute to. Uh, from an operations perspective, you know, again, upstream overt and OpenShift and OpenStack and, and things like this for cloud technologies. All of these are open source projects that we work in the upstream with and anybody can have access to. And from a storage perspective, we acquired Gluster for uh, NAS style storage, software defined storage using uh, the Linux operating system and then the storage layer on top of that. And then we also acquired InkTank. So Ceph is part of the Red Hat family as well for block storage. So a ton of upstream work being done there. And then some really cool stuff that we're doing like with the Condor project for things like high performance computing or high throughput computing uh, for computational clusters and things like that. Uh, we contributed a bunch to upstream technologies like NFS and, uh, you know, GFS, uh, uh, or I should say GFS2 since that's the current version. Uh, but there are a ton of projects that we work on there that, again, get adopted by a bunch of different um, distributions. And then from a developer tool standpoint, real quick, how many folks are, how many folks think of themselves as more developers than operations folks? Okay. How many folks are more operations than developers? Okay, good. We got a really good mix. Okay. So how many folks have used Eclipse? Yeah, okay. We do a ton of, of upstream development in the Eclipse uh, with the Eclipse Foundation uh, and, and a bunch of other technologies on here. There are technologies, there are developer tools on here for, you know, sort of typical um, middleware or application development all the way down to kernel level and C programming. So a ton of stuff there as well. So, did y'all know that Red Hat was contributor would uh, contributed to all of those upstream projects? A couple of you did. Well, you work here. I don't. <laughs> you, don't know. you better know. <laughs> so. Red Hat has acquired a bunch of companies. Just I've been I've been at Red Hat coming up on 13 years, and just in my tenure here, we've acquired a bunch of companies. And it's been really fascinating to see what happens when we do acquire a company, what we do around making that technology open source and building communities around it. Um, since we were founded, we've acquired over 30 companies. Some of them have been very successful, and frankly, some of them have not. We've made acquisitions that turned out didn't work out real well, and you know that that's just kind of the nature of doing business. But in every case where we have acquired a company or a technology, if it's been successful, we have either created or at least maintained and invested in existing communities uh, around those technologies. And interestingly, a lot of the acquisitions that we made were actually closed source. So we had to acquire something that was closed source. In a lot of cases, we had to go through a bunch of legal you know, rigmarole uh, because of licensed technology, a lot of technical rigmarole where we had to replace that licensed technology with open source technology. 
technology. Um, and we have spent a ton of time, effort, energy, and money in making sure that those technologies are accessible by upstream uh, communities and then building communities around those technologies. So, you know, if you look back at some of our early acquisitions, Sestina was a closed source company that was doing uh, HA clustering and a shared uh, clustered file system for Linux. We bought them, we turned around, we made it open source, and, uh, and uh, it's available out there on the internet for anybody to download. We acquired a lot of the Netscape assets from AOL. When y'all remember when AOL bought Netscape, um, our identity management platform is actually based on the old Netscape identity manager code. Now it's been so long that there's no code left anymore, but that that was absolutely closed source. We bought that from uh, from AOL and had to jump through a lot of hoops to make that open source. Uh, MetaMatrix for data virtualization, Kubernetes. Okay, no redheaders are allowed to answer this. Does anyone know what Kubernetes is responsible for? Yes. KVM. KVM. Spice. And Spice. That's right. So Kubernetes was a little company that we acquired out of Israel that uh, that was the, the the founders of and the inventors of KVM, which is now used in OpenStack and you know Red Hat virtualization. It's a it's a super popular hypervisor technology on the Linux kernel. Um, that was closed source when we bought it. The the kernel module, the KVM kernel module, is open source, but like the management interfaces and the uh, Red Hat, uh, what they called at the time, uh, what we called at the time, Red Hat Enterprise Virtualization. Hell, when we first bought it, it was based on Windows. <laughs> that went over like a ton of bricks. Um, but, uh, but yeah, so we bought that, turned around, rewrote it, made it so that it could be uh, deployed in uh, with open source technologies. And now Red Hat Virtualization, for instance, is an awesome technology. Uh, Manage IQ was uh, CloudForms, our, our multi-cloud management platform. Ansible. When we acquired Ansible, Tower was closed source. It's not anymore. So we've done a lot to make sure that, uh, that, that we have made those technologies accessible by anybody who wants. So just, just out of curiosity, how much do you guys think Red Hat has spent in acquiring technologies and then turning around and either maintaining them as open source or making them open source? Two million? Who said that? You're close. Four million? No, it's... it's we spent, if you tallied all up, the ones that we have records on, oh. okay, but a lot of them were private transactions because they weren't publicly held companies. Uh, and so there are some of them, I mean, there are a lot of them that we actually don't have dollar values on or that at least they're not publicly released. So on the low end, about $2.4 billion on the low end for, for technologies that we bought, either made open source or maintained as open source and made sure that the communities had access to them. Red Hat has also been involved in a whole bunch of legal fights on behalf of the open source communities that we participate with. Um, we've had Red Hat executives and evangelists who have testified uh, at the U.S. Congress. They've testified in front of the European Union Parliament. Uh, we have written amicus briefs for the United States Supreme Court uh, and various lower courts around the world uh, to fight things like patents, uh, software patents, to fight things like patent trolls, uh, to fight things like anti-competitive practices in the industry. You know, we spent a lot of, again, time, effort, energy, and money making sure that we were in the front of those fights to protect the smaller communities that didn't have representation. We've kicked the snot out of patent trolls, and that's been awesome. Um, there's been a ton of articles. There have been a ton of things that we have done where we have either beaten them in court or we've even purchased patents when it was at, at risk. We were just like, you know what? We'll buy it. We'll, we'll, you win this round, and then we turn around and make it available for free to the open source communities. So we, uh, we have done a ton of work around protecting intellectual property and trying to fight software patents. Um, we also offer a patent promise that says that if you're using our technology and that technology is found to infringe on a patent, we will indemnify you and we will also write code to replace whatever patent encumbered software there is. So we're very, very anti-software patents. Uh, we founded, we were one of the founding members of the Open Innovation Network, which is a collection of companies like it's us, uh, Google, IBM, NEC, Philips, Sony, Suza, and Toyota, of all things, Toyota. Um, 
and anybody who's working on open source, uh, any Linux related software can join Open Innovation Network. Uh, and we have a shared defensive patent pool. So if uh, if somebody tries to mess with us, it's almost guaranteed that we will have a patent to fight them back with. Yes. What is Microsoft going to join? That's a damn good question. I don't. I I can't presume to speak for them. Yes, sir. Very small question. Open Innovation Network. No, Open Innovation. Did I fat finger it? You did. Oh. <gasps> You didn't see that. Look away. <laughs> right after the statement. Dang it. <laughs> we have it. You have it both ways. So. Yeah, it's it's innovation. Even right next to each other. Really? Yes. Wow. Okay, I'm a moron. <laughs> it's been a long week. This whatever today. All right. So we're also involved in a lot of community programs from a, a supporting perspective. Um, we have a group inside of Red Hat called Open Source and Standards or OSAS. Um, I don't even know how many people are on OSAS now. It's gotten to be a very, very large team. Uh, there are technical folks, there are administrative and organizational folks and community management folks, even like marketing and, and artistic folks in OSAS who help communities organize. So if you're a member of a community and you're struggling with community management or if you're struggling with like how to form the community and how to get it vibrant and, and active, we can help. Go to community.redhat.com and we will absolutely provide assistance. Uh, we have done things, you know, everything from helping with governance issues and organizational issues and, and community management all the way up to simple stuff like, yeah, we'll host your website or we'll, we'll provide email services for your community. So we're very invested in making that happen. And if you go to community community.redhat.com, you can see there's a ton of information there. And, and I just did this screenshot today. You know, DevConf US is on there. We talk about uh, activities in the community. We've got an events calendar. Uh, we've got a knowledge base. There's a ton of stuff there that are resources for community managers. Uh, and, and if you need additional help, you can always email us and we'll help you there. So... Red Hat also has some developer programs that are that are absolutely focused on uh, thank you on uh, uh, community members. So Red Hat software is available at developers.redhat.com, and this was actually something that I and a bunch of other people, but but I was probably one of the most obnoxious about it, um, and I don't mind being obnoxious internally; it happens all the time. Um, but we fought really hard to have a developer program where folks could download Red Hat software and not do the 30-day eval or not do the $99 developer subscription that we had for years and years and years. There were a bunch of us internally who said, we cannot do this. If we want developers to be able to participate in the Red Hat community, not just upstream, we've got to make it available for free. And so they did. So the business units made it available for free. If you go to developers.redhat.com and click on Linux, um, got a cool video about Linux and scroll down a little bit, you can get a subscription to Red Hat Enterprise Linux, the developer version, which is the exact same version, but we also enable all the add-ons for like HA clustering and uh, a clustered file system and uh, GFS. I mean, a bunch of stuff we add on to it, and it's zero dollars. So we get the box too. No, unfortunately, we don't ship physical media anymore. <laughs> Nineteen ninety nine called. They want their technology back. <laughs> I know, I know, right? I would love to have that. I saw that. I was like, ooh, no. Okay, dang it. <laughs> but uh, but and what's funny is every once in a while someone will email and say, hey, I've got this old box set of Red Hat Enterprise Linux. Four, and I'm like, I'll take that. <laughs> Just ship it up. My wife's like, please don't. <laughs> So, but anyway, so, and over and above that, if you go to the middleware side, you can do the same thing with the JBoss stack too. So all of our, our all of our JEE middleware stuff um, and, and the entire developer suite, you can get started with the middleware developers kit as well. Zero dollars. Hello? So knocking on the door? Apparently. It's deliberate. Shh, don't tell them we're in here. <laughs> Uh, I, okay, thank you. <laughs> so, why? Why does Red Hat do this? We're a commercial company. We're publicly traded. I'm not going to even pretend to say that it's not very important to us to be revenue positive, right? We got 12,000 people that we got to feed and, and shelter and you know make their families happy and stuff like that. Uh, but when I came here in 2005... I came to Red Hat because I am an open source person. Um, I am a Red Hat. I'm, a, I'm an open source advocate. You know, I, uh, I my background, my background is kind of bizarre. If you already know the answer to this, please don't answer. But I'm just curious. Does anybody want to guess what I did before I got into IT? Are you really? 
it's locked. I mean, there was polite knocking. I know. It's like let me in. I no, we can't. It's locked. Anyway, so so anyone want to guess what I did before I transferred before I changed into IT back in 1993? Sales training. No and no. Car salesman. Oh come on. <laughs> Damn, shots fired, shots fired. No. What's that? Professional water polo player. I don't know where that came from. No, I was a police officer. What? I was a police officer. When I was when I was 16 years old, I volunteered through the police explorer program at my local police department. When I was 18, I became a corrections officer. When I was 21 and commissioned, I became a police officer. When I was 24, I was like, I can't afford to do this. <laughs> But one of the things that drew me to open source, because I started back in 93, worked on, you know, Novell Netware to date myself, and then on Windows, because that was the next big thing. Um, when, I, uh, when I got into Linux, when I got into open source, and I realized that there was this incredible community where you could get on IRC, or you could get on, uh, at the time it was Usenet, you know, comp.os.linux. blah, blah, blah. You know, you could get on these things, and you could ask questions, and people would answer, and it's like, that's the guy who wrote the code. <laughs> like, holy cow. And then I was like, hey, that guy's asking a question or that gal's asking a question and I know the answer. I can help them. And that was kind of my introduction to open source was I can participate in this community. Like, I can help other people. That's why I became a cop. And I learned that I can do it in the community as well. And I'm pretty typical of Red Hatters. Most of us who work here are doing this because the communities that we participate in are awesome. And we get help and we can give help. And it's, it's a really cool sort of karma thing. It's amazing. Um, when I came to Red Hat, we had 1,200 employees. Now we have over 12,000 employees. Um, I have I have worried over the years, like, how do we keep the culture? How do we keep that spirit alive? But um, myself and several other folks are actually involved in new hire and new manager training programs where we teach the culture and we teach the history of Red Hat so that as folks come on board, maybe they didn't come from the community, maybe they don't understand, but by the time they go through our new hire orientation, by the time they get into the trenches with us, they do understand how critically important it is that we participate in these communities. Um, most of us are very passionate about open source. Sure, there are some who just, you know, it's a job, right? But for the most part, we're really good about hiring folks who are passionate about open source. We're passionate about helping folks. We're passionate about enabling people to do things they never could have done if they had to rely on proprietary, expensive, closed source software. You know, when we did the One Laptop Per Child program, you know, that was one of the things that I was most proud of up to that point. And I keep getting more and more proud of the things we're involved in. Like, we put technology into the hands of people who could never ever afford it if if it weren't for the free nature the free is in beer nature of free software that's cool man i'm a tiny 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 little part of it but i am part of it and that is incredible to me and everybody at red hat most everyone at red hat is the same way and over and above that, we recognize that we are beholden to those communities that, that we get technologies from that go into our products. You know, we are responsible to, to make sure that those communities are vibrant. You know, we wouldn't be successful if it weren't for you being here today and participating. So we're grateful for that. Um, we recognize that we owe a debt of gratitude to the communities. We would not be successful if it weren't for what the upstream uh, maintainers and developers have done. And it's important for us to give because we have been given so much. You know, I got, I got a wife and two kids at home. And if it weren't for open source, if it weren't for these communities, I wouldn't be able to put food on the table. Or I'd have a job that I hated, you know? But instead, I get to come and talk to you. I get to participate in this incredible thing. And that's, that's a pretty pervasive attitude in Red Hat. And, uh, you know, I love it. I, when I came to Red Hat, I thought I was going to be there for two years. I thought, I'm going to go two years. I'm going to get some street cred. I'm going to be a consultant. I'm gonna... That was 13 years ago. <laughs> you know? I love this place. And I love that we are geared to being of service to upstream communities. And, and I'm not unique in that at all. So we are honored 
We are absolutely honored to be a part of your community, and we will we will do our best to be good stewards and to contribute. And we are thrilled to participate with you. So, thank you very much. If there's any questions, feel free to ask. Yes. So I just want to say, I feel like Red Hat needs to do a much better job explaining the technical aspects of Upstream first. Um, How so? I found a blog post from Dave Neary uh, in 2015 on community.redhat.com slash blog, where Upstream first turning OpenStack into an NFV platform, where it contrasted Upstream first with the vendor branch model okay. that all the other vendors are following. And it explains how it's harder to get all your patches accepted upstream and then backport them to your pro your product, your product mm -hmm. basically being like a legacy branch, mm -hmm. and how other companies say, oh, it's easier just to develop all the features on our branch. Yeah, it and is. and how that provides temptation to go proprietary in the future. And similarly, like I contributed to the X2Go project, and the X2Go product for like a decade rely on no machines, open core. Yeah. And uh, for for a while, it looks like, and and then sure enough, the next version of no machine was all proprietary. Yeah. And now we're you know have to develop the open core. I feel like Reddit needs to focus on the technical aspects of upstream first. I will I will do so the next time I present this. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Any other questions? So it's all well and good that you are such a heavy participant in these uh, communities, and it's very clearly felt in a lot of different places. But sometimes it also feels like um, when Red Hat is participating in communities, uh, it feels a little weird because like the reasonings or when the discussions are happening, it's like we get half answers or things like that. Mm -hmm. So I'm involved in Fedora and a number of other communities as a community person, and I interact with Red Hatters a lot. Mm -hmm. Um, and a lot of times it winds up being where I feel like I'm getting half of the answer or a quarter of the answer. And with the part I'm given, I don't think it's good or smart or anything like that. But like I feel like if I had the whole answer, we'd have a better discussion and maybe have a better result at the end of it. Yeah. Yeah, that's a fair criticism. Um, I'm not justifying it because I don't know the specifics of, of you know what you've experienced. Um, I will say... It is an unfortunate reality that, you know, like I said, we are we are a commercial company. There are things that we have to do from a product perspective, you know, that, that are going to um, dictate the way that we do some upstream work. And there are going to be times where we've got things that are going on that we can't disclose for financial reasons or for, you know, disclosure, legal disclosure. I mean, there's a ton of things like that. Maybe that's what happened. I don't know because I don't know the particulars of what you're what you're doing or what you're talking about. I will say, though, you know, if that happens, call it out. And, and I mean, don't be a jerk about it. And I don't I know you well enough know that you wouldn't. But but call it out, you know, call the person out privately and say, I know I'm getting a half answer here. Like, this doesn't make sense. Is there something going on internally that you can't talk about? Like, is there you know, what's going on? Um, we will do our best. And there is an internal policy. I mean, and, and it's not even a policy. It's an ethos of transparency and disclosure where we can. Okay. And, you know, I mean, if you run across something like that again, I don't have any juice really, but tell, you know, you've got Thomas at redhead.com, man. Send me an email. I'll help out if I can. Yes, sir. Um, Hold on. Wait for the mic so that we get you on video. You're being recorded for posterity. You, you, you talked about um, Red Hat being uh, good with upstreams. Mm -hmm. And I'm wondering if this is uh, in opposition to being good with downstreams. Um, as a person who is a uh, free software advocate mm -hmm. and a person who works independently on free software projects, um, I find Red Hat pro pro projects to be the most difficult to cooperate with in terms of uh, as an individual mm -hmm. coming into a project okay. and as a downstream. So like if I'm a user of, say, GTK, right. interacting with GTK folks is actually kind of hard. And it gets harder the more Red Hat they are. So like the more employee they are, mm -hmm. it gets harder. They get 
get harder to talk to, harder to contact, and so on. And I don't think this is necessarily a, a, a malicious thing or like mm -hmm. a problem, but it definitely does seem like um, my experience with the uh, the Ubuntu community back in the golden days, mm -hmm. uh, they focused a lot more heavily on downstreams, mm -hmm. maybe the, to, the, to their detriment on their upstreams. Um, but, <laughs> but I'm wondering if there is a balance to be struck between upstream fo focus and downstream fo fo focus. Yeah, actually, Stephen wants to answer that. Would you hand him the mic? So, uh, as Thomas mentioned, some of this... Uh, Red Hat has grown very fast in a fairly short amount of time, and there has been a certain amount of... We have seats that need filling, and sometimes they end up with uh, people who are looking at Red Hat as just a job and less of, less of the passion that some of us old-timers tend to have. And like Thomas said, there, uh, with, uh, with OSAS and with several internal programs, we're trying to express to individuals more about uh, why the community is so valuable. And yeah, there are times and there are some projects that are very heavily Red Hat employee-based that need, still need help uh, getting it. That that is what they should be doing. So there, yeah, there, there are pl times when we don't do a great job of this. Uh, call it out when you see it. Um, call, uh, if if you need to talk to me, uh, sgalag at redhat uh, dot com. Uh, I usually try to uh, take those take those people and have a meeting and you know ex you know explain the light to them. So. <laughs> Make it quick. I really, literally have to go to the airport like right this minute. So. <laughs> go, go. Okay, this can, answer can be done by any of the Red Hatters in this room, or perhaps not in this room. I am an ISV VAR partner of Red Hat. How do I work to make sure that n my um, business is noticed by Red Hat in that we do not have a cloud product? And we're we're not um, doing the the buzzword thing, but if it wasn't important, then I wouldn't be in this business. Thank you. I mean, join the club. Uh, yeah, we we do have to go, so I, I will answer, I'll try to answer that quickly. With a, it'll be a bit pithy, but um, we, we have a saying: uh, they who write the patch win the argument. Um, the, people will talk and talk and talk. Uh, the person who actually comes with something to, t to show off tends to get more attention. 